Brown. Welcome to this week's edition of Earthly News. I hope you're all keeping really, really well and that you've had a fantastic week. In terms of what we're going to be covering off in this episode of MFB News, first up, usual roundup of lender pricing changes and swap rates. <sighs> Don't get too excited, guys, I'm afraid. Um, but more on that to follow in a second. We're then going to be sharing some data that's been released by UK Finance which on the face of it sounds incredibly boring, actually. Um, but really, the information that's contained within this report is quite interesting. will give you a really kind of um, good insight into what's going on with the broader land or community. And then lastly, we're going to be wrapping up by talking about the latest um, report on changes to EPCs. OK, so last week, swap rates had come down. Um, five is swaps, which is over 3.7 for those of you who were watching and can remember. And I was feeling pretty um, good about the market and kind of the direction of travel. Unfortunately, swap rates haven't gone down any further. In fact, they've gone up a bit since last week. So two year swap rates as of 10.30 Tuesday evening, 4.405%. So slightly up from where they were in the previous week. Um, month on month, they are down though. So down from 4.421. So we're talking about a sort of reduction of 0.16% now. And year on year, so one year ago, uh, two year swaps were at 4.179, so elevated compared to one year ago, very, very fractionally down compared to one month ago. Five year swaps as of last night, 3.874, um, so back into the 3.8s rather than 3.7s, which is disappointing. Um, one month ago, 3.816, so actually five year swaps are slightly higher than they were one month ago. And year on year, so one year ago, 3.723, so again, slightly elevated compared to one year ago. So that is beyond frustrating, um, but you know, we're on this journey and it's never gonna be a quick kind of solution and things do bounce around. You know, it would be um, very strange for things to be consistently going in one direction, um, unless there was very good cause for it. So I think it's just a case of let's just wait and see how the next few weeks shake out. There's still a lot of chatter about interest rates coming down. You know, that's the reality of the situation. Um, the expectation is that inflation is going to continue to fall. So hopefully that will feed through to the capital markets and therefore uh, swap rates as well. But in terms of how this is shaken out in the lender world, um, it's been a bit of a mixed bag, quite quiet, actually. Um, I'm guessing half of the, uh, the country is still on Easter holidays. Good for you guys. I can only be very jealous. Um, so in the last week, we've seen Coventry increase rates by 0.4%. Um, Market Harbour have increased some of their rates by up to 0.5. And some of you, I'll hear you say, is who are the Market Harbour? Um, who you would only really know if you A, lived in Market Harbour or nearby, or you'd taken a mortgage with them. And the reason you don't come across Market Harbour very often, very, very niche lender. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so they have done do some really, really good stuff. So they can end on quite complex cases. So as an example, um, expats they're very good at. Another one which they're very good at is elderly applicants. Um, so people who are kind of beyond the sort of normal age of 75, 80, which is where buy step mortgages tend to get a bit more sticky. So they've got some really, really neat things in their lending criteria. Um, so we do tend to come to these guys um, for slightly more unusual cases. So their rates are up by up to 0.5%. Now, we have seen some lenders make reductions. And it's only a handful this week. Um, so Virgin, first of all, have... Um, well, first of all, they've added some 80% loan to value rates to their offering, and these are from 4.99%. They have also um, introduced some portfolio landlord two-year fixed rates, which are from 5.04% and five-year fixed rates from 4.74%. So they're pretty keen. Um, Santander have made rate reductions of up to 0.27%. So Virgin and Santander, very, very similar lender. Um, type of lender, sorry, so individuals only, no limited companies, maximum of 10 properties in the background. They do want you to have income that's not from rental, so you can't be a full-time landlord, you need to be doing something else or receiving income in some other way. Also, um, no credit blips, no unusual property types, all that kind of stuff. But actually, in terms of pricing, um, you know, they're, they're by no means the top, but they're actually sort of still fairly keen. Now, we have seen one specialist lender make reductions on pricing, and that would be Lend Invest and they have reduced rates by up to 0.15%. And they've also interestingly introduced free valuations. And this is a very specific thing now. So free valuations on small HMOs, those with less than six rooms, on their two year fixed rates. There you go. Um, and they're also now able to lend on smaller HMOs for first time landlords. So you guys will know if you watch this video often, that if you are a first time landlord, you've never owned a buy to debt, you don't currently own a buy to debt to be more specific. 
and you want to buy an HMO as your kind of first foray into buy to let investment, there are going to be lenders who will say, actually, we're not prepared to lend to you. You need some experience. There are a handful of lenders who can consider lending to first time landlords on HMOs. Um, Lend Invest are one of them. Kent Reliance would be the other obvious example that springs to my mind. So there has been some positive changes as well, um, but actually fairly quiet on the old lender changes in the last week. Now, in terms of how this is shaking out, I thought it'd be worth us just doing a quick roundup that we do every so often just to kind of give you a flavour of how this all hangs together. So at the moment, if you're an individual uh, looking to mortgage a standard property and you have a portfolio of less than 10 buy to let, so what we would call really sort of vanilla lending, two year fixed rates are from 3.79% and five years from 4.09%. Now, some of you might say, actually, I've seen two year fixed rates advertised, which are much lower than that, Jenny, so you're incorrect. Now, what I've done is, and when I'm looking through the list of rates available, and there are hundreds and hundreds of products available, um, there are many which, for example, on a two-year fix are coming in at lower than 3.79%, but these have absolutely whopper arrangement fees. So what I've done is I've kind of in my mind said, look, most clients are reasonably comfortable paying an arrangement fee of up to 3%, anything above that, they start to get a little bit nervous. Um, so what I've done is I've kind of aimed specifically for those products with an arrangement fee of 3% or less. So yes, there are rates which are lower, um, this is with arrangement fees of 3% or less. So two year fixed rates, 3.79 and five years, 4.09. Now, if you move into the specialist end of the markets, so your limited companies, landlords with more than 10 buy to lets, um, could include HMOs and multi units as well. Your two year fixed rates from 4.89, again, starting with the more reasonable arrangement fees and five years from 5.09%. OK, now UK Finance have released their quarterly review. And um, like I said, this might sound that it could be particularly dull, but actually it's very, very interesting. Or well, some of the points in there are quite interesting. Um, and you'll be glad to know that I've summarised them all into bullet points, the key ones you need to know, rather than going to read you the whole thing. Now, the first question that many of you are going to be asking yourselves is, who is UK Finance? And you'd be forgiven for not knowing unless you worked in the financial industry, financial services industry, sorry. So for those of you who aren't aware, UK Finance is essentially a trade association for UK financial services and banking companies, and they represent over 300 firms. So they have a really big reach into the UK lending market. They have access to lots and lots of data, which can be incredibly interesting. So without further ado, here are the figures that I want to share with you this week. So first of all, in quarter four 2023, new lendings, this is purchase and remortgage transactions in the buy to sector fell to 6.3 billion, which might sound huge, but actually this is a reduction of 55.4% from the same period in 2022. Now, this isn't kind of comparing apples with apples, to be fair. 2022 was an absolutely bumper year. Um, I don't know if you remember, but obviously we had the kind of mini budget in the final quarter of that year. Interest rates were escalating. Lots of people were really scrambling to um, book in rates as things kind of climbed. So actually there was a lot going on. Also, the property market was still very, very frothy at this point. Um, so, you know, transactions were much higher by virtue of the fact that it was kind of exceptional circumstances, but still just to kind of really, you know, put into context that lending has fallen by 55.4%, so absolutely huge levels. Now, in positive news, the average gross rental yield, sorry, has increased from 5.85% in the previous quarter to 6.74%. So that's an increase of um, almost 1%, so really, really large step up in terms of rental yields. However, the average interest rate that landlords are now paying has climbed to 5.7%, up from 3.67, so over 2% increase compared to a year earlier. So landlords are facing much higher mortgage costs. Now, worryingly, there's a reported increase in buy to let mortgage arrears with 13,570 cases exceeding 2.5% of the outstanding balance in arrears, an increase of 123.9% year on year. Now, this is being attributed to higher uh, mortgage costs. So what the, uh, the UK finance are essentially saying is that, yeah, you know, rents have increased. The yield has increased by 1%. This is fantastic. Um, but actually, mortgage costs have gone up significantly more. So landlords are still feeling incredibly pinched. Moreover, landlords have also have their own cost of living crisis going on. Landlords aren't immune to these things, just like everybody else. And also some tenants are struggling to keep up with their rental payments. So bringing all these things in together, that would kind of largely um, explain why mortgage arrears are increasing. And actually, incidentally, the number of buy to debt uh, repossessions has also increased. Now, just to kind of finalise this, the report that I read um, wrapped up with a very kind of strong message in terms of those people who are struggling to pay their mortgages 
um, UK finance represent lenders. So, you know, they're kind of reiterating the message from the lenders. And what they're saying is that if you are finding yourself um, struggling financially, please do not bury your head in the sand. Give your lender a call. They're ready to help and work with you to try and find a resolution or a plan that could kind of help keep things on track where possible. Alternately, you can always give us a call at MFB. We'd be very happy to chat things through with you, but please don't, um, you know, sit there at home worrying that you're just getting more and more in arrears and thinking you're never going to get out of this. Do give someone a call because everyone will be very, very pleased to try and help. Okay, now EPCs are looking very, very likely to change. So there is a report saying that the new home energy model is going to be replacing EPCs next year. And I think this is a really good thing. One of the complaints that we hear often from landlords is that actually EPCs aren't really kind of aimed at measuring um, the um, carbon emissions of a property. They're measured on how cost effective um, heating a property actually is, which isn't necessarily driving a green agenda. So as an example, one of my clients was complaining that they put in a ground uh, source heat pump into a property and it actually reduced the EPC rating rather than improving it. How on earth could that be right? So um, the whole thing is under review. And the way that the energy efficiency of homes is calculated is going to be changing and also subject to a series of extra checks. Now, it's very likely that the cost to get one of these um, home energy model reports is going to be higher than the EPC cost, which we're currently paying. And this is going to be owing to the time it's going to take assessors to conduct the report owing to the extra checks. Now, homes under the current arrangement ratings are given a standard assessment procedure, so a SAP, which is, is kind of affectionately known as. Um, the replacement home energy model will use a new future home standard assessment, which will um, assess essentially um, the things that are currently being assessed but also factor in measuring all of the windows in the property rather than simply relying on an assumed measurement, carrying out additional assessments on rooms in the roof, introducing a new age band for properties which were built in 2023 and onwards. They're going to take into account the use of um, power diverters and battery storage used in conjunction with solar panels. So essentially these things are going to kind of, if you've got solar panels, this will help improve your EPC and also, as I mentioned earlier, recommended the use of, or recommending, sorry, the use of heat pumps more frequently. Now, the key point is that properties are going to be assessed on carbon emissions rather than factoring in costs. So this is exactly what clients of our clients have been sort of crying out for, which is really, really positive. Now, this is currently in consultation and could be introduced in April 2025. And I think one of the key things that you need to know is that there's no guidance yet in terms of what will happen to existing EPCs. Um, as we know, EPCs have a 10-year lifespan, um, so what one can only assume is that if you have a current EPC, that will kind of remain valid and see out its 10-year period, and then you'd need to get one of the newer reports next time around, but no guarantees on this, guys. It could be that actually you'll be required to, within a shorter period of time, um, maybe by you know 2030, everyone has to have one of the new reports. We just don't know, so that's going to be sort of announced later. But I think actually... Um, some people are saying that this is going to be a bad thing because there's going to be more checks, which means there's more kind of things for landlords to potentially have to do to drive up the um, kind of efficiency of their properties. And actually the cost of doing the report is going to be more expensive because of the deeper checks. But actually, you know, one of the things that I think we all really want is to be greener and actually you know, producing a report which drives greenness in a property. So reducing carbon emissions rather than just thinking about the cheapest way to heat properties um, can only be a good thing, particularly when focusing on the green agenda. And I think we're going to call it time on it for this week, guys. I would be doing a question of the week, um, but what I'm trying to do is be very conscious about how long these videos are because I don't want to kind of dominate for too long. So on that note, next week we will have a question of the week, I promise. Um, but if you have anything you'd like to ask, please just leave a comment in the box below. Very, very happy to answer questions. Um, and that's kind of it. So in the meantime, until we see you again next week, if you have any questions, give us a call 0345 345 6788. Have a nosy at our website or you can email in as well. Have a super week. I hope the sun shines down on us and take care of yourselves until next time. Music